This week we are in the studio talking about 3D printers. Back in 2015, I bought my first FDM 3D printer and here it is. It is the Lulzbot Taz 4. Sorry, it was the Lulzbot Kitaz 4. The big difference between those two is the Taz 4 was a pre-built machine where the Kitaz came in a hundred different pieces. And I got the joy of building my first 3D printer. Even before you start using it, you see places that can be approved immediately. <laughs> To which I did. Within the first week, I added a tensioner system to the Y belt. It actually is being tensioned by a Dremel piece um, that's very crucial to the design of it. But that's just a V groove roller that presses onto the belt slightly. Um, and over time, as the belt stretches, the uh, tensioner pushes on the slack side so that the sides that are actually doing the pulling is always tensioned correctly, therefore not losing position. The other modification that I did was replacing the two crossbars that went along the x-axis. And the original design had the two polished steel rods. The issue was in the middle it would droop either between a half a millimeter to a millimeter compared to the sides. What that meant is if you had a long part that you were printing, it would sag. So because the Lulzbot was open source, you could download all of the part files. So I downloaded the native files for the supports for the two rods and I redesigned them to hold a 20 by 40 millimeter piece of extruded aluminum that was of the same family as the frame of the printer. That fixed the rigidity and to make my life easier working with it, I used four of the V-Groove roller wheels from Open Builds, I believe at the time, to properly tension the frame of the extruder onto the crossbar. And I did that by having two cantilever wheels on the bottom that in its natural orientation, the shape of the V-grooves would be about one millimeter narrower than the shape of the extrusion. And that meant it was always clamping on the extrusion, which meant I never had to adjust it. I made those modifications probably the first month that I owned a printer and have not touched them since. So even eight years later, this thing could theoretically still print. The reason I decided to go with this printer is because at the time for this size envelope, the competition was the Ultimaker and the MakerBot. I forget which mark they were on at the time. And then this. And this came in less expensive than both because I bought the kit version. And what attracted me to it was how open source the entire design was. Allegedly at the time, MakerBot was going through a lot of their hot end issues with not warranting them, them malfunctioning a lot, them not being easy to clean, just a whole gamut of issues from that community and a lot of disappointment. So if I was going to be constantly fighting with my 3D printer, I wasn't gonna buy it. The Ultimaker at the time had locked down their filament choices, I believe, and you had to use their material and their spools to be able to print because they hadn't like integrated it into the machine. But because I couldn't just go buy whatever filament I ever wanted, or as the industry progressed, start coming up with more creative element filaments, um, I wouldn't have been able to use them in the Ultimaker. So after probably studying at the time, three to six months of figuring out which printer I wanted, I went with the Kitaz 4. To make using this printer as 
friendly as possible. I spent a lot of time working with the post and pre-G-code scripts. At the time, it was notorious for extruding too much material at the end of the print, having a big blob on the part if it didn't move correctly. Then you had to worry about cleaning the nozzle if it did extrude after the print before you printed it. So you were always doing a lot of like manual labor to the printer before you actually printed anything. And then there was a lot of manual labor afterwards. So I spent a lot of time working on the pre and the post G code script, which nowadays, if you look at it, I mean, like in five minutes, you can probably figure out what it took me about a week to figure out but I was new to writing it. There wasn't a lot of how to's at that time. I was figuring it out on my own and I was printing a lot of 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter cubes. In the end, what I got was the head would move up 10 millimeters. It would come to its home position to this side and then it would push the table all the way out to present the part to you. It would also retract the extruder, I forget how much, but enough to be able to pull the filament completely out and not ooze any material after the print was done, which put it in a really good position to always have a clean nozzle for the next print. The pre-print process was no matter what was being printed, it would always print about a half meter of skirt before it would start the print. It would be independent of the size. So if it was a very small print, it would run around the part 10 times. If it was a really big print, it would only do two times just to get the filament back into the head, get all the air bubbles that might have formed out and get the filament bead up to a standard to be able to print the part. And it would start printing the part. Later, I went and added this, I don't even remember what it's called at this point, this special material that Lulzbot started putting on their build plate that when heated would help adhere to the part. And then when cooled back to room temperature, the way that things either contracted or shifted would break its seal with the part. So I could print with TPU, I could print with APS, I could print with PLA, no matter what it was, during the print process, it stuck to the bed. No prep at all. I didn't have to do the ABS slurry. I didn't have to do the glue stick trick. I went through all that in the beginning. Um, it was a pain. Um, I even went and got some of that tape that you could put on the bed to do what this material does. It was all just a pain. It, it made printing frustrating. And when I read the sales pitch for this material, I bought in, I said, what the heck, let's try it. And sure enough, it worked for me. I would print the parts. As soon as the parts would cool, I would come back, pick up the part off the bed, um, use a little spudger or something to get underneath the skirt, get that edge off, peel it right off. And that's all I had to do to prepare for the next one. I would go through a weekly routine where I would clean the entire bed off and re-level the bed or at least check the level of the bed. It was a lot of work in the beginning to be able to create a printer that I know and could trust day in and day out to print whatever I wanted. And I think the longest print that I did on this and you have to remember, this was back in 2015, 2016, when the industry was still so new. None of the Prusas or the Crealities or um, the Anycubics, they just weren't out yet. And it was a very experimental stage in the hobbyist 3D printer world. Um, and to have a 3D printer that you could trust and leave for 14 hours straight and know that you could come back to the part, it was kind of miraculous from what I could remember. I by no means was an expert at this. At the time that there, at the time there were so many young YouTube channels just starting to get into the 3D printing world and 
within six months, I you could consider me a novice compared to the stuff that they were doing. But the time that I spent with this 3D printer got me to a point where I could do anything I wanted and I didn't have to worry about the printer and it worked. The thing that killed my optimism for this printer was the seeming lack of support for the software. The Lulzbot borrowed off of the Kira platform and every time the Kira platform came out, Lulzbot would take and reskin it for their printers. And I'm pretty sure through an acquisition, there was a time where the Lulzbot support just became non-existent. And there were a lot of workarounds that were needed to get the Cura software to work with a Lulzbot. It could have been done. I didn't want to put the effort into it year after year, software update after software update. And I just kind of got tired of using the printer. There was no need or want or desire for me to buy a new, less expensive 3D printer to upgrade to potentially have a printer that performed as well as this one did. So I fell out of that until last week. So let's swap the printers out. Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, I bought a Bamboo Labs X1C with the AMS. To answer the question why my employer has a print farm of 12 of these to print organization trays for bolts that runs basically 24 hours a day. And last time I was there, he showed me the printer farm. He showed me how the parts were coming out. Luckily for me, a print just finished. So we were able to pull it off of the mat, pop the mat, get the part off. And he literally flicked the support material out of the holes <laughs> into the trash can. And the underside of them was just spectacular looking. So when there were 12 of them in one room and they were all chugging along, I was basically sold. The other reason is if Bamboo Labs becomes a staple in the 3D printing world and the support for their products lasts for decades, the closed, closed ecosystem or software support that they have should be phenomenal. And I'm saying that from two aspects. I lived the open source world with the Lulzbot and while it was young and while it was new, it was great. But once it got old and the interest was gone, the support started to dwindle. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I have the Form Labs Form 3, which is a super tightly closed ecosystem. Their market is also a lot different than the markets of, say, Anycubic or Elegoo. I totally said that wrong. Um, or any of the other less expensive, the matte LSLA printers. Um, two different market segments there. The tightly closed down ecosystem of the Form Labs basically means you have to live inside of that environment. And as long as you're happy being inside of that environment, you're going to have a great time using the tool. But that has a few downfalls. The VATs are single use. They have a very short lifetime to it, while the resin selection is expansive from form labs the price is a little bit more than most people would want to pay the one-time charge of buying the printer is easily absorbed in the years and years that you're going to get out of it as long as you maintain it and the maintenance isn't super hard 
just have to make sure you take care of the vats. You have to clean the build plate between each print and the printer will last and work fine. But if you try to step out of bounds of what Formlabs wants you to do, you're going to start breaking things and you're going to start having a bad time. But the company should be around for a very long time and the support for the software should be around for a very long time. So it will always be improving. Now my opinion of Bamboo Labs, I feel hits the sweet spot. The software that they have developed seems pretty great. The little tools and tricks they have, including the camera, having the AMS to be able to do multicolors, having the poop bin in the back to be able to purge things easier, the automated um, nozzle cleaner, even the calibration they do to understand the vibrations that the table is sitting on, I feel have a lot of advantages to them. But at the same time, you can use any filament you want to. If you don't have one of their spools that fit in the AMS, you can just hang it off of the back. Um, if it doesn't fit on the back, you can make a new bracket and have it fit. It will happily use any 1.75 millimeter filament. That's a subject for another video. Based on what I know and what I experienced between the two extremes of printers that I have, I think Bamboo Labs and their X1C is going to be a really good printer. But if Bamboo Labs still supports the printer in eight years, I won't have to upgrade. And if I do, it's because they've made a three foot by three foot by three foot print volume that I want for some reason. But I think that's it. I'm super excited to have this printer now. I'm super excited to be back in the FDM world. I'm super excited to start working on a lot of the projects I have planned for this. I like having the large print volume again. I like the idea that this thing can print so much faster than the form labs. And there are many projects where I'm going to be using a combination of both printers to make parts for. So we are going to hop this on the back corner over here where it's going to live for the rest of its life. And we are going to close this video down with saying thank you. I know this video was a little bit different. It was a fun style. I'll probably do more of these. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next week. Bye. It's going to be real fun trying to figure out how to make three millimeter filament into 1.75 millimeter filament.